What is up, people of the multiverse? Welcome to my Crisis on Infinite Earths Part 2 review, and holy crap, we have got so much to talk about in this review. We had uh, future Batman in this, we had uh, different Supermen in this, we had a whole bunch of things in this uh, episode that, uh, yeah, I'm just going to get straight into it. So guys, if you if you go on to enjoy this video, please leave a like on it as it really does show your support for the channel, helps the videos out. If you want a place to talk about Crisis after this video and hang out with me, uh, you can join my Discord server. I just wanted to plug that because I love talking to you guys in there. And other than that, everyone, uh, let's just get some hype about Crisis because if it just keeps carrying on like this, then we only have... Well, we're only in for a treat because this episode gave us a lot of that. The beginning of this episode, everyone, it started off, of course, drinking to Oliver. Uh, but it kind of reminded me in this conversation between Kate, Sarah, and Kara, you know, Dig was at home with JJ, who still doesn't know about Oliver. And I was just like, wait, what? That is such a good point. Never in a world did I think that Oliver Queen would die without Diggle at his side. But they actually did that. But I know Oliver's coming back and he kind of has come back and everything. And we'll get to that in this episode. Uh, they needed Ray's lab, but a different wave rider was to be utilized for that, which brought us to the Earth 74 wave rider, where all the legends there had retired. All but Rory, with the fine addition in this episode, which would have been the last thing I would have expected as well, with the voice of Earth 74's wave rider being Leonard Snarts, which, you know, was, uh, oh man, I miss Captain Cold so much. He, he was definitely one of my favorite characters in the whole Arrowverse back then. So honestly, stuff like this, I, I love. But this is where we get into the real meat of the episode, with the modern monitor saying that across space and time there are seven heroes beings of the purest will that can ultimately help you know defeat the anti-monitor and they are known as paragons now the monitors only recently learned of their existence after consulting the book of destiny there was a bit of comedy in this moment uh, with baby john crying and ending up in rory's arms now i both found this funny and i didn't at the same time i mean i saw this clip yesterday before the episode was even released and i as i said i found it funny but at the same time i couldn't help but feel like maybe it was a bit too forced uh, only in the terms of how it was maybe one too many interruptions but i don't know ultimately everyone's gonna feel different about that i bet some of you found it absolutely hilarious i bet some of you absolutely hated it i bet some of you didn't really care but moving onwards this is where we kind of got a couple of answers that i felt were quite important because a lot of people have been asking this even on the comments of my uh, part one review yesterday kara mentions bringing back earth 38 with the book of destiny but the monitor mentions recreating an entire world would surely drive one to madness so that's something to bear in mind and then in terms of bringing oliver queen back with reference to lex luther as he got brought back as the anti-monitor gets stronger the monitor grows weaker so i'm glad we got that answer because yeah like yeah the monitor could in theory bring him back but you know unfortunately with the way things are with the antimatter's presence and everything like that uh the mirror of the anti-monitor which is the monitor doesn't have the required power to do so which is why things went in a very interesting lazarus direction for oliver queen which is yeah we're gonna have to get onto that stick around for that but first of all i need to talk about gotham city so we found out that kara supergirl is the paragon of hope we found out that sarah lance is the paragon of destiny and the paragon of truth is the brandon ralph superman who they needed to find throughout the episode and the fourth one is the paragon of courage which is the bat of the future but not all is as it appears at that point in the episode i'm not sure if any of you kind of got where this was going if they truly meant bruce wayne with that or as we later found out ultimately to be kate kane but anyway earth 99 exists in the future time and yeah i i both loved everything about this but also felt a little bit as, as a huge bat fan a little bit taken back at points and i think from the fandom there's going to be a lot of interesting opinions on what went down with batwoman and batman this episode so Earth-99 Gotham City introduced some very interesting things. And by the way, there was this shot of the Batmobile, uh, which is apparently a very quick uh, very quick scene in the episode, which if you blink, you kind of miss it. I actually didn't pick it up, but Mark Guggenheim tweeted this photo out. So I'm sure some of you will appreciate seeing this. They did actually have a very classical Batmobile in there. Uh, we got introduced to a very different Luke Fox. But when I heard that first line, like, don't be so rude, Luke. Oh, man. I was just like, yes, that is the Batman voice. The definitive 
Batman voice. But oh boy, did I not expect things to go in a direction, the very dark direction of where they went. And I'm not putting a whole bunch of criticism on this, by the way, uh, because, you know, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with the Bruce Wayne they portrayed here. Just in terms of how this Bruce Wayne, uh, he pulled out like a newspaper saying the Batman's reign of terror or is over and it was a you know a snippet from the Gotham City Gazette and he's lost track of how many people he's killed like he pointed out to Kate in terms of how you know Bruce did have a code or at least that's what Kate mentioned and how he did start out with a code as well uh, and you kind of hang on to it but once you take a life and then you take another life and then you take another yeah it's kind of like a dark road often in the comics or you know just in the character himself he is one step away from being like that there's not actually all too much which separates him from the craziness of the joker but he as he said himself you kind of cling on to it but if he if he were to ever fall off that he would more or less end up as the bruce wayne we've seen in this episode but it kind of went above and beyond what i ever thought it would i thought that would be the extent of it but no kara finds mementos or should i say trophies from Batman's history. So we have a bloody Joker card there, so you can probably safely assume that he's killed the Joker in this world. Uh, snapped Riddler Kane, similar thing there. Superman's glasses, so we found out in a very Batman versus Superman way, uh, he killed Clark Kent. Like, he's literally killed the Superman of Earth-99, but as a result, that is why he's in this exosuit, because that's what Superman did to him before he passed away. Uh, we also had a Two-Face coin, by the way. Uh, we had Ivy's uh, plant in a little dome, and we also had, like, a Mr. Freeze snow globe. So, yeah, like, if any of you guys watched Titans, uh, the season one finale, uh, it, with how Batman went rogue and killed his rogues gallery, uh, that, that that's kind of, like, what this Batman did. Which I'll say once more is something Batman would do if he ever abandoned that code of his. I mean, he pretty much summed it up himself. He's okay with these other worlds dying, in, in his own words, saying maybe it is for the best. There was no hope for this world. And I just absolutely love that line as well, just whether that's in the terms of like a Dark Knight Returns kind of way, or whether that's, you know, the most recent Batman versus Superman uh, iteration, and where he says to Kara, saying, what, a strange visitor from another planet comes to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those than a mortal man? Oh, man, like, that—that that is very... Oh, man, just hearing Kevin Conroy say that. I, I love these parts. And this all concluded with literally Bruce Wayne in his exosuit, or should I say future Batman, fighting Supergirl. Like, literally engaging Kryptonite in his exosuit. I really didn't expect this to happen, and to be honest with you, I don't quite know how I feel about Batwoman killing Bruce Wayne. Now, I, trust me, I do get it, like, he was kind of fighting Supergirl, and, like, it was just one thing after another, but then typically landing into that, you know, oh, I just happened to get electrocuted through falling back on this thing. I, I don't know. I honestly don't know how to feel about this. It kind of did work, but at the same time, it, it's just, like, did, did they have to go to that length? As I mentioned earlier, I'm not knocking them for doing this kind of darker twist on Bruce Wayne, who didn't turn out to be the Batman that we know. That's completely relevant and a possible reality in my mind but the way it ended I felt like was a bit of a stretch um, and I know not everyone will feel the same about this some people will think it would be fine and this all was ultimately leading up for the audience to find out as well as the, the characters that Batwoman is actually the paragon of courage I mean at the bottom line I guess this Batman didn't really have much to live for anymore uh, essentially he had just given up all hope and I, something like that was his very last line so I get how it drives Kate Kane forward and it's also a reminder to like protect Gotham City back on Earth 1 and just persevere more than ever but I don't know I just felt like it I don't know I, I I'm just not totally comfortable with the way the Batman went out in this episode but hey that's just me it's not really a massive criticism, it's just an unsure feeling. But then on the other side of things, everyone, we had the hunt for the Paragon of Truth, which was the Brandon Ralph Superman, which led us on a fairly interesting journey. But first of all, we had Harmager acting fairly funny on the Wave Rider earlier on in the episode, hearing voices saying stop him. And this is where we found out that Lex Luthor had got a hold of the Book of Destiny and jumped through a breach portal. And uh, yeah, he just kind of wanted to kill every Superman out there in the multiverse, which is a very Lex Luthor thing 
to do. And a great example of this was Earth 75's Metropolis, where they did a Death of Superman reference on TV, where we had an Elizabeth Tulock Lois Lane crying over naturally a Superman's death. And so they hopped over to another Earth, which was Earth 167, and that was Smallville's Earth, which I really appreciated the lots of newspaper articles this scene started off with, such as, you know, the caped wonder stuns the city, or the I spent the night with Superman article, which is a very familiar one. And it also had like the Smallville finale ending picture, and then Superman saves the day. And I just loved the exchanges uh, between the various characters in these scenes. Now, naturally, Lex Luthor spews some crap about just saying how they're going to be, you know, enemies in no matter what universe. And Clark is just kind of grinning the whole time to the point where Lex even got some kryptonite out and it didn't affect him. Now, I actually kind of saw this coming because when Clark was chopping the wood, uh, he was kind of, uh, you know, struggling with it a little bit. I mean, or just, you know, exerting himself like any human would. But at the same time, I just didn't know if they were paying that much attention to detail because what I was thinking was if Superman was doing this, it wouldn't really, or they should have filmed it in a way where it didn't require any effort to chop logs. And, you know, even Tyler Hecklin, Superman was like, well, I can do that with my bare hands. So I thought, oh, well, maybe he's kind of given up the cape, but it was just a little fleeting thought. And then it turned out that he actually did. He gave up his powers. So in order, I guess he could have had a family. Now, at the same time, I get how some people may not be happy with this because you could just argue Superman can have a family whilst wearing a cape. But it's also a nice kind of bow or ribbon on the Smallville series. Like he was Superman for a number of years, but ultimately, you know, he, he's, he just wants to be a family man, a full time family man. Um, and to those who really thought that uh, Clark Kent, or should I say Tom Welling's Clark Kent, was going to suit up in this crossover, fair enough, I guess, you know, wishful thinking at most, but I, I never thought it was going to happen. Like he's been more than vocal about it in the past. And I, I, I did end up thinking if they were going to put him in a suit, it would have just been CGI, like a CGI scene where maybe they would have killed him or something like that. But they didn't even do that. It turns out that he just didn't want to be Superman anymore. All in all, I, I enjoyed it. Um, I wasn't expecting much. Uh, just because we knew how short his scenes would be if you've been paying attention to the crossover behind the scenes. Uh, but I would love to hear your thoughts about it regardless in the comments down below because this was naturally one of the most anticipated moments or scenes for one of the characters in Crisis. So now that the Smallville Clark Kent is out the way and too busy with Lois cleaning up the mess that his daughters had made, they went to go to Earth-96 Metropolis and that's where Brandon Ralph's Superman was and this kind of had everything. I think everyone was looking forward to the Brandon Ralph Superman whether that was the Superman themes, uh, the references, such as, you know, how he mentioned that reject from Gotham, who felt like the paper didn't cover him enough, so he gassed the whole building, and he lost everyone in one fell swoop, which was obviously a reference to the Joker's gas. Uh, they couldn't even use the Joker's name, which I found interesting, because they would have they would have said it. They, they really would have said that instead of reject if they could, but, you know, limitations and all of that, even though we did see a Joker card earlier on in the Batman segment. But either way, things got very interesting here when Lex Luthor decided that he was kind of a little bit bored of killing Superman, so he wanted a Superman to do his bidding and take out Tyler Hecklin's Superman. And this led to this kind of CGI battle with the very kind of uh, clay-like CGI models of characters in the Arrowverse. I mean, sometimes it looks all right, but there were quite a few shots in this battle, and I'm not, I'm not being too harsh on this. You guys know what I'm on about with the clay-like models of the CGI, whether that's on the Flash when he's a speedster and there's CGI scenes. And obviously when you're doing Superman here versus Superman, it kind of pulled off in a similar way. I'm not trying to shit over it at all. I'm just saying as cool as this was, especially that little moment when they connected fists and it sent out that ripple wave that shattered. Like, trust me, I appreciate all of it. However, I have no idea how Lex Luthor allowed himself to get knocked out by Lois and Iris. Like, surely he, he saw them sneaking up behind him convenient for plot but okay you know moving onwards uh i appreciate as well the old version of the heat vision you know that they, that they tried to do it wasn't a very modernized one and that was done very deliberately ultimately they brought this superman back there was even a little reference to his son from superman returns i believe um in terms of how their baby looks like his son jason which you know is leading to all kinds of theories right now in terms of what if this kingdom come superman dies and you know with the superman and lois show apparently with with the family dynamic on there being with a kid who's a lot older than uh, what baby John currently is, people are now starting to think, what if this Brandon Ralph Superman dies and they adopt 
Jason. That would be very interesting. And this is, is where we get to Oliver, which I, it took a direction I really didn't see coming. So this all started off with Iris hoping that the monitor is wrong about Barry since he was wrong about Oliver, which, you know, is fair enough. Uh, but anyway, Barry mentioned the Lazarus pits from other Earths for Oliver. This is where Sarah hears about it from Mia and isn't mega happy about it since she has gone through it herself and mentions, you know, the loss of humanity because your soul and everything like that, which is completely fair enough from her, you know, because it did, it was quite a story arc for Sarah and which is why I was kind of worried about it being introduced in this crossover episode because, as I said, it's been a whole long thing for other characters who, who have used the pit in the Arrowverse and yet for Oliver that they might just kind of rush it. But the way it was done was interesting. So obviously, uh, John Constantine was utilized. He warned them about the nasty business of the Lazarus pit uh, and even kind of scanned the whole universe, if you will, because so many Earths have already gone and were vanishing as they spoke. But he found one with a functioning Lazarus pit. So this is when they headed to Earth 18's North Dakota. Uh, Jonah Hex was randomly there. I mean, was that it for the cameo? I expected a little bit more. Uh, as he said, the mine was off limits, but that's about it. And so Oliver got put into the Lazarus pit waters. And this is where I thought maybe it wasn't going to work because it was taking a while. I mean, I, I think it has taken a while in the past, but nope. It, they actually did it. He came back. He, he came back to life. He came out all beastie, which makes sense because, you know, he's very feral right now, barely has a soul. And that's when John tries to get the soul back. But with all the antimatter within the system, he's kind of lost his mojo, which was a very Austin Powers comment to say. So, yeah, I mean, I don't mind this. Like, uh, Lazarus Pit is always an easy kind of thing to use. I mean, you could argue maybe it wasn't before because, uh, you know, Thea destroyed all the pits, but there is a whole multiverse. So I do get how they've done this. Uh, I, I just hope it doesn't make Oliver's death in the first episode in vain. A lot of people have found it to be lackluster, and I'm glad that I wasn't the only one thinking that. And I wasn't trying to, by the way, shit on Oliver's death, you know, or let him have his death. A few people were saying that when I was critiquing that something was missing in part one with that. I just felt like it was a bit kind of glistened over but maybe deliberately so because I did mention that Oliver would be coming back in some form or another and lo and behold here we are which is why maybe you know technically that first death might not be the real real feelsy death of Oliver Queen from Earth 1 that we uh, maybe came to expect or maybe what I came to expect with this crossover now that he's back and I'm sure once he kind of gets his soul back or something there will be an even bigger feelsy moment don't get me wrong like I teared up in that moment in, in the last episode but I'm just saying like it, it felt like there was something missing. And then at the very end of the episode, uh, we got Harbinger acting weird again, kind of having this interference in her brain. And that's when she was teleported to the location of the anti-monitor and that's where he says you know a few lines like with every death i steal my mirror's strength and you know there is work to be done and i don't want to get into depth about this in terms of what harbinger and the anti-monitor uh have in common in the story so you know it's gonna be interesting to see how the cw bring that into fruition next episode you know because there's a lot that could go on next episode but it's good to finally see the anti-monitor i feel like they could have done something with him a lot sooner but you know i feel like it's also appropriate as well to see him on screen the way we have his voice was very similar because naturally if you didn't know already he's being played by LaMonica Garrett like both anti-monitor and monitor um and this brings me back to the whole pariah discussion I'm not saying that pariah was talking to the anti-monitor at the end of the flashes episode last week when he was pressing the paragon symbols on the wall and then he was sucked in by the big gleaming white yellow light but I will stick by what I said in terms of you know in terms of who he was talking to which you have to assume to be the monitor it sounded very different and very off and now we know that they sound very similar and you know whoever pariah or should i say nash wells was talking to saying bow down to me bow down to me, like that was very off but the confusing thing about it and i mentioned this in yesterday's review was that you know technically there was antimatter waves being sent out before december 9th when nash wells finally got to enter that room and thus became pariah we have still yet to see how he became pariah after the tease of his lines at the end of last episode but i will say keep an eye out for that scene when he actually got sucked into that room when he was told to bow down to the guy who sounded like the monitor 
As I said, like it sounded different, it sounded off, and I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Because go back and rewatch that scene from the latest Flash episode, you, you will kind of see what I mean. But overall, everyone, uh, that was Crisis Part Two, and I and I really enjoyed it. But like at the same time, I feel like it was it was a bunch of really cool things. I guess what you would call fan service, but it felt like essentially nothing moved forward in terms of progress as of where we were left at at the end of last episode. But it was a whole bunch of little bonus missions if you know what I mean. If you're looking at this like in the analogy of a video game, you didn't progress the main story, you just did a bunch of side quests. And that, that's the only way I can put this. And that's not a bad thing, by the way. I think they're doing a great job so far, what they've done already, and I can't wait to see what happens from the next part. But guys, I would love to hear your thoughts. Like seriously, I always ask this, but let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. If you enjoyed this episode and this video as well, guys, I would really appreciate it if you left a like on it. It really does help out the channel, helps it get seen little bit more uh, share it with your friends share it on twitter or any social media that that would be great so thank you very much there subscribe with the notification button turned on so you never miss out on a future video of mine but anyway everyone thank you so much for watching i hope you guys have a lovely rest of your day and i'll see you people of the multiverse in the next video goodbye